Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about the idea of a limit. This lesson marks our entry into an entirely new section of mathematics. We are entering calculus territory. From here on out, this course will preview some of the topics you'll be exposed to in a calculus class. You might wonder what calculus is and why it matters. In short, calculus is a new way to look at functions. It gives us new tools to analyze function behavior and see how they relate to one another and the world around us. As to why it matters, calculus is crucially important to science and engineering. If you want to get anything of like any real depth done in those fields, you need calculus in your tool belt. Plus, I think it's just really cool. It's one of these really cool things that you can do in mathematics. It's a really new, interesting idea, and we get to play around with it and see all sorts of cool stuff. And it creates, from here on, we get to see a whole bunch of new stuff that lets us explain a whole bunch of phenomena in the real world. Really cool stuff. So for the next few lessons, we'll focus on limits. Limits allow us to describe functions in ways that were previously impossible for us to describe. We'll be able to approach the infinite and the infinitesimal, that being the infinitely small things with them. And they make up the heart of calculus. They're pretty much the foundation that the rest of calculus uh, rests upon. So it's really useful to have a good understanding of what a limit is and how it works before we can start moving into other ideas in calculus that have more direct applicability to the daily, daily world. All right. Let's start off with a motivating example to get things rolling. Consider the function f of x equals x divided by x. What happens if we try to look at f of 0? Well, if we plug 0 in, then we're going to get f of 0 is 0 over 0. But since dividing by 0 is not defined, f of 0 does not exist. Therefore, we cannot evaluate the function at 0, f of 0 is not a thing, right? We can't do anything with it. And that's the end of the story, right? That's, that's it. And up until now, that would have been the end of the story. But now when we look at f of 0, well, OK, sort of. It's kind of the end of the story on what f of 0 is. But before we entirely write off the idea of considering f at 0, considering how f and 0 interact, let's look at the function's graph. So if we look at f of x equals x over x, well, hey, look at that. The function is always 1. Now, right here at x equals 0 on our vertical y-axis, we've got this hole here. That circular hole tells us that it does not actually exist there. But anywhere that isn't x equals 0, we wind up getting a 1 out of it. Huh. So on the one hand, f of 0 does not exist, right? You plug in a 0, you get 0 over 0. That's bad. You're not allowed to divide by 0. So we say f of 0 does not exist. But on the other hand, it's obvious where it's headed. Look, the thing is going right in towards that 1. Like, on the one hand, sure, it doesn't exist. But come on, it so totally should be a 1. So we cannot say f of 0 equals 1 because f of 0 does not exist, remember? But we still want some way to talk about where it was headed, right? It was clearly going to be a 1 before those pesky rules about dividing by 0 got in the way and stopped us from being able to figure out what the real answer should have been, right? What, it, what we feel like it was going towards, at least. Perhaps not the real answer, because we'll talk about, you'll see other things about why we can't really assign a direct value to it. But we can talk about this idea of where it was headed. And we talk about that with a limit. So with this idea in mind, we want to think of a limit as the where it was headed. So a limit is the vertical location that a function is headed towards, what it is going to be at, as it gets closer and closer to some horizontal location. So in that previous example, our motivating one of x over x, we had as it got closer and closer to 0, it got closer and closer to being at a height of 1. In fact, it was always at a height of 1, no matter where it was. So we wound up seeing the sense of as it closes in on 0, it's really, really close to this value, where it's headed towards. Equivalently, a limit is what the function output is going to be. So what the output is going to be as we approach some input. So as we get close to some input, what output is seems like it's going to come out of it. What should it should it be, right? What's it going to be? We're going to be talking about this idea a lot, so we want some notation to describe it. We use this notation right here. Lim 
this part here, the limb says it's a limit that we're working with. The x arrow c says what we're going towards, and the f of x is the thing that actually is having the limit be applied to it. That's the function. So this says the limit of f of x as x approaches c. So as x gets close to c, what happens to f of x? You might also hear this spoken aloud as the limit as x goes to c of f of x. I tend to say that a lot. Or you might hear some similar variant. In any case, the idea is the same. It's this question of what does f of x do as x gets very close to c, right? x is going to c, and our question is what will f of x do in response to x going to c? Let's test out our new idea on an old friend, f of x equals x squared, the good old hardy parabola. Consider if we wanted to find what value x squared approaches as x approaches 2. So as x gets closer and closer to 2, what does x squared become? Well, if we graph it, we graph f of x equals x squared, and we see that the answer is exactly what we expect, right? 2, as we get really close to a 2, we wind up getting really close to a 4, right? As we come in from the left side, we can see that the number, the value that we're getting to as we get closer and closer to a 2 from the left side, our vertical height gets closer and closer to a 4. Similarly, if we come in from the right side, as we get closer and closer to 2, and x equals 2 from the right side on our horizontal location, we get closer and closer to a vertical location of 4. So we wind up getting 4 as the limit. As x approaches 2, x squared gets really close to 4. It becomes 4 as x approaches infinitely close to 2. So as x gets closer and closer to, to a value of 2, f of x gets closer and closer to a value of 4. And that's why we wind up getting this limit. Now to expand our ideas, let's look, modify the function and see what happens. So consider the piecewise function g of x, which equals x squared when x is not equal to 2. So that's most of our parabola right here. And 1 when x equals 2. So at the specific value of x equals 2, as opposed to following our normal parabolic arc, we wind up putting out just a value of 1. This is a piecewise function. If this isn't ringing any bells and you have no idea how to interpret this sort of thing, go back to the lesson. We saw this a long time ago, right near the beginning of this course, the lesson on piecewise functions. They'll show up a lot, especially in the beginning of calculus, so they're an important thing to have under your, uh, in your understanding, under your belt. So if this doesn't make any sense, go check out piecewise functions from the early part of the course when we were studying functions. All right, so with this idea in mind, let's ask, what is the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x? Well. What we want to know, we might be tempted first to go, oh, hey, look, it's right here. That's what x is at 2. Yeah, that's what, sorry, that's what g of x is at 2, right? g of 2 is 1. Well, yes, but we can also think about it as what are we getting close to, right? Well, as we get close to x equals 2 from the left side, we see that we're getting really, really close to what height? The height of 4. As we approach from the right side, we see we're getting really, really close to what height? The height of 4. So our first knee-jerk response might be to think it's got to be here because that's what it is at x equals 2. But the limit isn't about where you actually are, right? x over x produced something where it actually, as a limit, x over x, as x goes to 0, produces 1, even though actually the function just fails to produce anything. So a limit is about where are you headed towards, not what actually happens at that location. So we don't really care about what happens here. This part isn't important. The thing that actually happens at 2 isn't important. It's a question of what happens on our way to 2. Well, on our way to 2, the thing that we're getting close to is this location at Four. That's the location we're getting to. So the answer of this, the answer for this limit will be 4. So g of 2 is not equal to 4, right? g of 2 is equal to 1 because at x equals 2, we just spit out 1 for that function. But as x approaches 2, the value of g of x approaches 4. g of x jumps, right? It does this sudden leap off of the parabolic arc only at x equals 2, right? It only swaps at x equals 2. What it seems to do up until that moment is it seems to behave like x squared, because for everything that isn't x equals 2, for everything 
other than x equals 2. It behaves just like x squared. So up until that moment, it's behaving just like x squared. And because of this, it has the above limit of becoming a 4. It's going towards a 4 until that single moment where all of a sudden when it actually touches the 2, it jumps away. But up until that moment, it seems like it's going there. So that winds up being our location. The vertical height that it seems to be going to as x approaches 2 is 4. In a way, we can visualize what's going on by doing the following. Begin by graphing the functions normally. So we graph f of x normally, x over x. Whoops, that should not say x over x. That should be x squared. Sorry about that. So that should be f of x equals x squared. And over here, g of x equals x squared when x is not equal to 1 when x equals 2. So we've got this single part that jumps away, this single point that's not on the normal curve. Then what we can do is we can wind up covering up the part that we're going to. So notice in this case, what we're about to consider is the limit as x approaches 2. So as we get close to this value, as we get really close to this on both of them. So with that idea in mind, I'm going to swap this back out. It should be an x squared. We're looking at the limit as x goes to 2. So as we take the limit, what we do is we cover up the horizontal location x is approaching. Because since it's a limit, what we're concerned with is what happens on our way to that value, but we don't actually care about that value in specific. We don't care about that horizontal location. What we care about is our way to the horizontal location, right? It's the journey that matters, not the destination when it comes to limits. So the limit is the height we expect what we feel like would happen without peeking under the cover, right? So we've got that black bar there that keeps us from being able to see what it actually turns out to be. But in this case, it seems like, hey, yeah, what it's going to come out to be is 4. If all the information we have is just the picture in front of us, except, you know, that part that's been covered up, we're not allowed to look under it. So the information that we have makes it seem, yeah, it looks like it's going to 4 in both of them. The idea is the question of what we expect will wind up happening. Where does it seem like this function is going to? That's what a limit is about. With all that in mind, we now have the ability to create a more formalized definition. The definition of a limit. If f of x becomes arbitrarily close to some number l as x approaches some number c, but is not equal to c, we don't actually care about that horizontal location, we just care about the way to that horizontal location, then the limit of f of x as x approaches c is l. Symbolically, we write that as limit as x goes to c of f of x equals l. The limit as f of x as x approaches c is l. So as x gets close to c, what value does our f of x seem to go to? What value is f of x getting towards as we get close to that horizontal location? Two important things to note. We are looking at f of x as x goes to c, but not concerned with x equals c. So for the purposes of a limit, x is never equal to c. We're only concerned with what happens on the way to c, but not actually x at c. Remember, it's the journey, not the destination that matters when it's a limit. The other thing to notice is that when we consider x approaching c, we're considering x approaching from all directions, not just one side, right? It's not just this side, it's not just this side, it's both sides coming together. To have a limit, f of x must go to the same value from both sides. So the right side and the left side have to agree with each other. If they go to totally different things for a horizontal thing, for a horizontal location, if they go to totally different heights, then they don't agree, there's not a limit. There's not a sense of what to expect if they are going to totally different places, right? Where is it going to be? Is it going to be somewhere in the middle? Is it going to be the top guy? Is it going to be the bottom guy? We don't have a good sense of which one, which side to trust, so we can't get a limit out of it. The two sides have to agree for us to wind up having a limit. Technically, I want to point out that this isn't actually the formal definition of a limit. That said, what we're seeing here is going to certainly be enough for now. This idea, the definition of a limit that we just talked about, this whole thing here and all of our commentary that came after it, all the stuff that we've been working through so far in this lesson, this is plenty for the class you're currently in. A pre-calculus level course like we're in right now, this is more than enough of an understanding of what a limit is. You're doing great at this point. Even for a calculus level class, this is really 
pretty much enough understanding. Some courses will maybe vaguely talk about the formal definition, but very, very few will really expect you to fully understand the formal definition of a limit. This is really the, all they're looking for, is the sense of a limit is what you are going towards, but not where you actually end up. And pretty much most science courses, most engineering courses, this is really all you need. If you want to talk about the really formal definition of a limit, that's going to show up later on in really advanced math courses, like second, maybe even third year college math courses, really proof heavy math stuff. And I think that's really great stuff. But for the most part, you'll be fine with just this really probably forever. However, if you're really interested in mathematics, you might want to check out, if you're curious, you might want to check out the next lesson, formal definition of a limit. I think this stuff is really really, really cool, and I've got a great lesson that'll help us explain and understand what the formal definition of a limit is, but frankly, probably 99 times out of 100, you're never going to need to know that stuff. Pretty much any class that you'll be taking in the next two years is never going to actually require you to know the formal definition of a limit, so don't sweat it too much if you don't feel like watching it. It's totally a fine lesson to wind up skipping. But if you're interested, it's really cool, and if you're interested in this, you might wind up being interested in taking advanced math classes later, and it will totally come into play later on, and you'll be a step ahead of everybody else in understanding this fairly complicated idea. All right, so let's keep talking about limits. So far, all the examples we've seen have had limits, but a limit does not always exist. For example, consider the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over x. Well, here, so what we're doing is we're looking at as x goes to 0, right? The y-axis is at x equals 0. So as we come in from the right side, we aren't actually going to a single value, right? We're just going to go up and 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 up. And we don't ever stop going up, right? It's a vertical asymptote. When we worked on rational functions, vertical asymptotes, we just go on up forever. So there's no single L value, right? There's no single limit number that we're going towards. So there's nothing that can be agreed upon. And even worse than that, we wind up going in the totally opposite direction when we come from the left side, right? One side shooting off to positive infinity, the other side shooting down to negative infinity. There's nothing to say for the limit here, right? They're not approaching something where they're agreeing on some value. They're not even going to separate values. They're just blasting off to infinity on both sides. We don't really have a good way to talk about this. There's no way to assign a specific number value that we expect will happen at x equals zero because it's just going to clearly freak out, and that's that. There's nothing that it's going to go to. So because of that, we say that the limit does not exist. So this limit does not exist. There can be no limit as x goes to zero because there is no single value that one over x is headed towards. There's nothing that wind up that we're going to wind up seeing them agree on. Even one side is not going to agree on anything because it just keeps going up. So there's no single value, therefore there is no limit that we get out of it. Still, I want to point out, for x approaching any other value than zero, the limit would exist because it would approach a single value, right? If we approached one as our thing, then we would wind up approaching one. If we approached four as our thing, then we would wind up approaching one over four. If we went to negative three, if we were approaching negative three from both sides, then we would be going to negative one third, right? All of those make sense. The only issue is here at x equals zero, where because it has an asymptotic thing, it just freaks out, shoots off in both directions. There's nothing that we can wind up pinning it down with. So we have to say that the limit does not exist. But anywhere else on one over x would exist. But x going to zero does not exist for one over x. In the previous example, limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over x, that didn't exist. And But at the same time, 1 divided by 0 does not exist either, right? f of 0 didn't exist, and so limit as x goes to 0 of f of x didn't exist, and there was a connection there. However, it is possible for the function to exist, so we can have the function exist while the limit does not exist. So to see this, take for example g of x equals the piecewise function x squared when x is less than 1, so we see this parabola on the left side, and 4 minus x when x is greater than or equal to 1, and we see this straight line on the right side. So we've got every single point in the real numbers defined, right? They will wind up having some value that the function will spit out, right? If you plug in any number, it's going to either be on the straight line portion, or it's going to be on the parabola portion. So g1, g of 1 equals 3, right? If we plug in 3, we use this one, so 4, sorry, if we plug in 1, we use 4 minus x, 4 minus 1 gets us 3, that's this point right here. However, the limit as x goes to 1 of g of x does not exist. Why? Well, from the left side, we wind up approaching this value here. We're approaching this side as we approach from the left side. However, as we approach from the right side, 
we wind up approaching this totally different value. And so there's this big gulf between the two limits, right? We're going to two totally different places at this horizontal location. So the function approaches, the function approaches two totally different values from the right and left sides. Since they don't agree, we can't say, oh, that's what we expect because we have totally different expectations from the two sides. So that means the limit does not exist. So how do we actually go about finding limits in general? First, really great way to do this is with graphs. One way to find the value of a limit is just to look at a graph of the function. So if you've got a graphing calculator, you can plot it on a graphing calculator. If you've got some sort of graphing program like I make these graphs with, you can plot it on a graphing program. Or if you're just really good at making graphs, you can draw a graph. Figure out if a limit there makes sense, right? Is there something where this both sides are going to the same thing? And if so, find what value the graph indicates. So for this case, we've got f of x is equal to quantity x squared plus x minus 2 divided by quantity x squared minus x, right? x squared plus x minus 2 on the top, x squared minus x on the bottom of the fraction. So we see that there are some parts where we have issues, right? If we plug in x equals 0, we wind up having an asymptote. And if we plug in x equals 1, we wind up having this hole here. But we can still ask, what is the limit as x goes to 1? Well, if we go to the graph, as x goes to 1 from the left side, we wind up seeing that we're approaching that height of 3. As x goes to 1 from the right side, we see that we are approaching the exact same height. So we wind up getting a value of 3. Either way we wind up approaching this, we're going to wind up seeing 3 is what the expected value is. The graph shows us that we're working towards 3, or something that at least on this graph looks mighty close to 3. So we could say 3, but of course, we're reading a graph. Reading a graph isn't always as precise as we would like, right? Reading a graph, we know that you can sometimes be off by half or one whole thing. So it doesn't give us a perfect answer, but it gives a pretty good idea. We have a good sense of what it's going to be, although it's not perfectly precise. However, limits do have the massive benefit of being able to allow us to get an intuitive sense of how the thing is working. They let us see what the function is as a general idea, and sometimes that is the most useful thing of all. So graphs are really, really handy, even if they don't let us see precisely what the value is. They let us understand what's going on. Does it even make sense for it to have a limit here? Things like that. That's what a graph allows us to answer. Alternatively, if we want something that's more precise, if we want a more precise sense of where the limit will go, or we don't want to graph the function just because we have some sense of what the graph looks like, or we just don't feel like graphing it because we know it's going to be a pain, but we have enough of an idea to know that the limit would exist there, we can use a table of values where x will approach the value that approaches in the limit. So once again, we've got the same f of x equals x squared plus x minus 2 over x squared minus x. And now we're looking at as the limit as x goes to 1 of that function. So same limit as before. So what we can do is we have 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999. So we're approaching 1 from the left side there. We can approach it from the right side, 1.1, 1 1.01, 1 1.001. 1 so we're getting closer and closer values. Now, of course, we can't actually plug in x equals 1, because if we plug in x equals 1, it's just going to fail on us, right? And the limit isn't about where it actually would be. It's about what happens on the way there. So we don't plug x equals 1 into our table. All we're concerned about is what happens to the numbers as they get really close to x equals 1. We calculate this with a calculator. 0.9 comes out to be 3.222. comes out to be 3.020. comes out to be 3.002. Going from the other side, 1.1 1 .1 is 2.818. 1.01, 2.980. 1.001, 2.998. 1 .1, so we can see that the value that we're getting close to, right, 2.998, 3.002, we're clearly tending pretty darn close to the value of 3. So we can assign this limit is going to wind up having a 3 as we get closer and closer and closer. Now, maybe we're off by, you know, 0 0.0001 or 000, you know, some small number, but we can be pretty darn sure that unless it somehow does some really sudden jump there, 3 is probably going to be pretty darn close to it. So that lets us get a good approximation. Probably a good approximation within many decimal places, but we're not absolutely precisely sure. Still, that's really, really close. And the closer our table has x approach the number, it is approaching in the limit, the more sure we can be, right? If we, instead of using 1.001, we'd use 1.00000000001, we'd be that many more decimal places sure of where we're headed, right? Same with 0 0.9999999999, right? By plugging in more and more decimal places, we get more and more accuracy.
So we can be more and more sure of what the value that we'll wind up getting out of that limit is. If you have a graphing calculator, this is a great use for the table of values feature, where you can just set up a function, then go to the table of values, have it be an independent thing where you plug in each number, you plug in 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.9999, and you hit them all in, and it will just spit out values for you, and you won't have to type in the entire equation over and over, uh, the entire expression. So check out the course appendix. There's that appendix on graphing calculator as part of this. Um, it's a great thing to check out if you have access to a graphing calculator that table of values will make your life so much easier when you're working through this sort of thing really good use here precise methods so the lesson after the next is finding limits so not the very next lesson which will be the formal definition of limits which you can totally skip if you're not particularly interested but then one after that you will want to watch and that is finding limits in it we'll see ways to precisely find the limit of a function through algebraic methods so graphing uh, table of values, those two things give us really good approximations. They give us a good sense of what's going on, but they don't get tell us what the value has to be precisely. We'll figure out algebraic methods in the next, next lesson, finding limits. For right now, though, we'll just stick to the methods of graphing and making tables. They're pretty good methods, actually. So even after you learn those more precise methods about how to figure out algebraically, precisely, don't forget about these. They can be really handy when you can't figure out how to figure it out precisely algebraically, but you still need to evaluate it and get a good sense of where it's going. You can always use these methods. Now, often you'll wind up having problems where the problem says that you have to get it precisely and you won't be able to use these methods. But sometimes you'll have some really, really complicated thing and you won't be able to work it out. You can just toss in a table of, uh, a table of values, something like this, and you'll be able to get a good sense of where it's headed and that can be useful. All right, we're ready for some examples. For each limit below, if it exists, determine the value using the associated graph. So our first one, limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over x squared. Well, what we can see is that as we get closer and closer to x equals 0, this thing just shoots off, right? Both sides fly off to infinity. They shoot off forever and ever and ever. So even though they're both going towards positive infinity, do they ever wind up establishing at a single value? Does it ever settle on a single value? No, they're always going to keep going up, right? It's going up asymptotically, so there's never a number that they sort of, you know, steady out on. They never decide to land on 47 or some other number. So since they keep going on forever, it doesn't have a limit. So the limit here does not exist because it never settles on a single value, right? It shoots up to infinity forever, and since it never winds up sticking around at a single value, it never settles on a single value, so we wind up not being able to get a limit out of it. Next one, limit as x goes to negative 3 of x plus 3 divided by x squared plus 5x plus 6. So in this one, if we plug in negative 3, hey look, there's a hole. So we can't just directly plug in negative 3, but from the graph we can see, yeah, there's nothing wrong, right? We're approaching the same thing from the left and the right side. What value are we approaching? We are approaching a value of negative 1, so the limit is negative 1. Great. Next one, evaluate the limit as x goes to negative 2 of 3x squared plus 5x plus 1. We could graph this, right? This is just a parabola. It wouldn't be too tough for us to graph. And if we graphed it, we'd wind up seeing that it looks something like this. But, and we could figure out what it is, you know, draw a really careful graph, but drawing a really, really careful graph, that takes a fair bit of effort. And we have a good sense, yeah, there's going to definitely be limits everywhere because it never does anything weird. It never jumps around. Everything that we expect to happen is what happens, so we don't have to worry about that. But that's what the graph gets us. So at this point, now we want to actually figure out what the value is. Easiest way to figure out what the value is is we can just plug in values, right? We make a table of values. So. We're going to have x on the left side and the f of x that comes out on the right side. What value are we approaching? We're approaching negative 2, so x going to negative 2. So if we are a little below negative 2, we'll be at negative 2.1, then negative 2.01, then negative 2.001. On the other side, we will be coming away from negative 2, negative 1.999, negative 1.99, negative 1.9. If we plug these things into our calculator, negative 2.1 gets us 3.73, negative 2.01 gets us 3.0703, negative 2.001 gets us 3.00703. Flipping to the other side, negative 1.9 would get us 
negative 1.99, we get us 2.9303. Negative 1.999 gets us 2.9903. Zero, zero, 0003. So it's pretty clear what we're approaching, right? As we go in from each side, negative 2.001, negative 1.999, they're getting really, really close to this middle value of 3. So that's what the limit winds up being. The limit comes out to be equal to 3. That is the value that it's approaching. Also, remember how we talked about, well, look at that graph. The way that graph is there it doesn't do anything weird. Everything that we expect to come out of it is what's going to be that function's location, right? So what we could do, another thing we could do is, because in this specific case, the graph doesn't do anything weird. The function doesn't jump around in any weird ways. There's no breaks, there's no, you know, and there's nothing strange about it. So if there's nothing strange about it, what we could do is we could also go, well, that means that the limit has to be what the function actually winds up going to at that point. So we could also just evaluate it by plugging it in, three, negative two, squared plus 5 times negative 2 plus 1. 3 times negative 2 squared gets us 4, plus 5 times negative 2 gets us negative 10, plus 1. 3 times 4 is 12, plus negative 10, so 2 plus 1. Hey, that came out to be 3 as well, so that checks out as well. So what we just saw there was actually one of the precise methods of doing this stuff. We'll talk about this more in finding limits, but it seemed like a really easy one for us to see. Oh yeah, we're going to start to get a sense of how this stuff works when we want to find the precise stuff. So we'll see more and we'll also understand exactly why we can do this in the coming lessons. All right, third example, limit as x goes to zero of sine of x over x. So if we were to graph this, if we used a graphing calculator, graph what comes out of this, we would see that it's going to look something like this. Oh, I actually screwed that graph up. We would see that it was going to look something like, there we go, that's better. So it's going to look something like that. All right, so the easiest way to do this is to just do a table of values. So we've got x and f of x is coming out of it as we plug in various values for x. So our x is approaching 0. So if we're approaching 0 from the under it, we're going to be negative 0 0.1, then negative 0 0.01, then negative 0 0.001. And you could use different numbers as long as they continue to get closer and closer to 0. But I think those are pretty easy ones to use. From the other side, we would be coming away 0 0.01 on the positive side now, 0 0.01 and 0 0.1 now that we are past the 0. We plug these into a calculator. We figure out what it is. We get negative 0 0.1 going in gets us 0. Point, also, remember, this has to be in radians for us to, well, actually it doesn't have to be in radians because of this specific problem, but any time we wind up seeing a function, we should assume that it's in radians unless we've been explicitly told otherwise that it is in degrees, but normally assume that it's in radians when you're doing math. So 0 0.998334, plug in negative 0 0.01, 0 0.9999, 83 negative 0 0.001 0 0.999999 on the other side 0 0.1 we have 0 0.998334 0 0.01 0 0.999983 and 0 0.0001 0 0.999999 so it's pretty clear what we're winding up approaching here. As we get closer and closer, the value that we're approaching is 1, right? The value that this is getting really close to is 1, and it seems to show that it's going to get really darn close to it. So we see that the value of this limit is 3. Fourth example, using the associated graph, explain why the limit below does not exist. So the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of 1 over x. So just glancing at this thing, the answer is simply, it freaks out, right? Look at this thing that's happening here. It is freaking out. This graph is doing some really weird stuff as x gets close to zero. So as x gets close to zero, what's going on? Well, notice how we can see that it's going up and then it goes all the way down, and then it goes all the way up, and then it goes all the way down, and then it goes all the way up, and all the way down. Same thing on the other side, up, and then down, and up, and then down, and then up, and then down. Well, what it seems to be doing is it's going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, and faster and faster as it gets closer and closer. So it's freaking out. It's bouncing up and down forever. 
So it's bouncing up and down forever as it gets closer to this x going to zero. It's just bouncing so, so fast. So as we get closer and closer to that x going to zero, we don't have any idea what to say because we're flying around, right? The closer you get to x equals zero, it constantly changes. The function is constantly changing, constantly going up and down because it's constantly bouncing up and down forever and ever and ever and ever. We wind up saying, it doesn't have a limit, doesn't exist, right? The limit does not exist because it doesn't settle on anything. A limit has to be settling towards some value and it has this crazy freak out there. So we wind up not being able to say it has a limit. The limit does not exist. If you want a better idea of what's going on here, and I think it's always cool to have a better idea of what's going on, we can break this into two pieces. One over x, the graph of one over x winds up graphing let me put that in black just so we can easily see it. So the graph of 1 over x, here's our axis, winds up looking like this, right? We're used to that nice vertical asymptote there. And then the graph of sine, let's say t, just some dummy variable t that we plug in, it's going to wind up having that nice periodic graph, right? That's how sine works. It goes up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down, right? So that's what happens. However, what we've got here, the t that's going into this, the thing that's going into this is one over x. So what happens is the value as we get closer and closer to zero, well, what happens to that asymptote as we get closer and closer to zero? As we get closer and closer to zero, they shoot off to infinity. So what we've got is we've effectively got an infinitely long amount of stuff that we are plugging into sine of t in a very small, compact space. So that's why we wind up seeing it's going slowly, and then as it gets closer and closer to zero, one over zero, one over zero, that's not really formally accurate, but one over zero is effectively shooting off to infinity, right? One over zero shoots off to infinity. So if we're shooting off to infinity, and then we are plugging something that's going all the way out to infinity into sine, well, that means our periodic thing is going to go up and down forever. But because we're doing all of this foreverness in all of this very tiny distance of, you know, 0.1 to zero, that means we wind up having it go faster and faster and faster and faster because it has to manage to do all of infinity in zero to 0 0.1 pretty crazy. So that's why we wind up seeing this behavior. And if that still doesn't quite make sense, don't sweat it. Honestly, you'll be fine in a pre-calculus class and even a calculus class without fully understanding this idea. But if you let this rattle around in your head and think about it for a while, you might start to go, oh, I'm seeing, I'm seeing it. There's some really cool ideas in math and lots of the cool ideas in math wind up taking a little while to fully click. So even things that you don't understand the first time, the second time you look at it might make a lot more sense. I think this stuff is really cool. All right, ready for our final example. So for each limit below, if it exists, determine the value using the associated graph. So our first one, limit as x goes to 0 of 2x over x, well, that one's pretty easy. It's clearly going towards 2 because it's just steady state at 2 all the time. While at actually plugging in 0, if we plug in 0, 2 times 0 over 0 gets to 0 over 0. We can't plug in 0. So it doesn't exist at 0 over 0. But on the way to that x equals 0, it exists just fine. So we can see what the limit that it's going towards is. So the limit that it's going towards is 2. Similarly, over here, limit as x goes to negative 2 of negative 3x minus 6 over x plus 2. What is it going towards? It's going towards that thing, which is negative 3. So it is going to negative 3. If we actually plugged negative, oh, yeah, if we actually plugged negative 2, right, if we plugged negative 2 in, well, x plus 2, so negative 2 plus 2, we get us dividing by 0, things would fall apart. We're not allowed to do that. But as long as we're not plugging in negative 2 directly, everything's fine, right? We always wind up having negative 3, as we can see from this picture right here. So since it's always negative 3, then the limit of what it's going towards, we don't have to worry about that thing that's actually at, the limit of what it's going towards is negative 3. Simple as that. Also, I want to point out to you something that we're going to see in the finding the values of limits. We can actually get a jump start on what's going to happen to get that idea percolating through your head. Look, 2x over x, well, at x equals 0, it winds up doing something different. But with the exception of x equals 0, 2x over x behaves exactly like 2. So because it behaves exactly like 2, we can effectively say, well, what would it be at 0 if we were using this other alternative way of talking about it? The other alternative is you're always 2. So since it's always 2, we wind up getting a limit of 2 out of it. Same thing going on over here with negative 3x minus 6, negative uh, 3x minus 6 over x plus 2. 
Well, we can rewrite that top as negative 3 times x plus 2 over x plus 2, which means we can then write an equivalent thing with the exception of x equals negative 2. Everywhere else, we won't have that issue. It'd just be the same as negative 3 forever and always. So with the exception of that x equals negative 2, it works just fine, but we don't actually care about negative 2. Remember, there's that idea of blacking out, right? We're covering up that chunk because we're not allowed to peek underneath the cover. So if we cover up that chunk, and then we try to figure out, well, where is it headed towards? We don't have to worry about the fact that if we had plugged in negative 2 here, it wouldn't work because we're not worried about what happens at negative 2. We're just worried about what happens everywhere else and what it's equivalent to everywhere else is negative 3. And so that's why we wind up seeing it. Just a quick preview of the ideas we'll wind up getting when we start talking about finding limits precisely with more algebraic methods. All right, so that gets us a really good idea of how limits work. Just remember, it's the idea of where are you going and does it match from both sides? The question of where you're going, but it doesn't matter what it actually is there. It's about the journey, not the destination. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.